Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll do. A, uh, so AUA just released the guidelines in uh, 2015, um, just on uh, updating clinical practice uh, with respect to Crohn's disease, given the new uh, some of the injectables that have come out. And uh, we'll talk about those, and we'll go through uh, just in terms of objectives quickly. Just want to review quickly the natural history of the disease, epidemiology, clinical presentation, and diagnosis. And then we'll uh, we'll talk about some of the new surgical non-surgical management options, um, just in terms of uh, new injectables that have come out and uh, the data that support their use, as well as uh, like Dr. McNeely said, touch on some new and emerging surgical modalities uh, for uh, treatment in the operating room. Um, just a quick background, this is the gentleman responsible for naming the disease after himself. Uh, this is uh, Francois de la Perone, and he is, uh, <coughs> he is, uh, was the actual uh, surgeon to Louis XV of France, but I don't know if Louis XV actually had Peroni's disease, but uh, he was the one that first described the uh, induration of the corpora and then subse subsequently described the first treatment option, which is topical uh, mercury. Um, I don't know how far that went. He probably made more work for himself than anything. But um, he was also instrumental in banning uh, barbers from practicing surgery as well. So that was uh, an interesting caveat to his... Uh, time. Um, but what is Peyronie's disease? So we know it's, uh, <clears throat> it's an acquired penile abnormality and uh, effectively it's fibrosis of the uh, tunica albuginia. Um, now generally these people are, uh, 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 it's associated with pain, uh, deformity of the penis and erectile dysfunction and oftentimes it's uh, associated with significant distress. <clears throat> In terms of the epidemiology of the disease, the true prevalence is not actually truly known. What we know is that it's pretty widely distributed in the literature. It's uh, estimated anywhere from 0.5% of all men to 20.3% of all men. Um, in fact, actually, if you look, and they did so in the late 60s, uh, autopsies of 100 uh, people, 23% uh, of them had histological evidence of Peyronie's disease, which is actually it's quite striking. Um, likely the true incidence is around 3 to 9 percent and the age of onset usually is around the early 50s but doesn't, it's not necessarily inclusive to older gentlemen. Young men get it um, all the way to you know above 70s and what it is and what we've shown is that it's a linear um, incidence increase in prevalence from 30 to about 50 and then it exponentially increases after that. Now the Prevalence uh, is usually associated with uh, just extremes of the sampling group. So <clears throat> in terms of the clinical uh, conditions that are associated with um, Peroni's disease, big ones uh, are things like diabetes. So men with diabetes, they estimate approximately 33 or a third of men with diabetes have clinical evidence of Peroni's disease. And then those with Peyronie's disease have upwards of 50 to 60 percent incidence of erectile dysfunction with their disease as well. Um, as we heard from last uh, week um, from Dr. Elliott, that uh, we know that in uh, patients undergoing radical prostatectomy, uh, within approximately two years, 16 percent of those patients will develop Peyronie's disease, and that's not necessarily um, determined by uh, treatment modality, so there's no difference between robotic versus open, and of course Dr. Glee's not here, and Dr. Goldenberg's not here, so I can't get them to go, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> hypogonadism is another thing that's respond or that's uh, closely associated with uh, Peyronie's disease. In fact, if you look at plaques in men with low testosterone, they're bigger, and the curvature of the penis is worse, and this is most likely thought to be due to um, decreases in erectile rigidity. Uh, associated with low T. Uh, of course, the classic associations probably all know about is uh, collagen disorders, including things like Dupuytren's disease, uh, Lederhosen, and uh, um, tympanosclerosis, which is collagen deposition uh, disorder problems. A uh, closer look at the albuginia of the penis, <clears throat> we can show that it's a multi-layered structure. So it's actually two layers, an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer. And normally these layers can actually slide over top of each other. Um, interesting thing about the outer layer, it's deficient where the urethra courses through at the 5 to 7 o'clock position and it's weaker at the 3 and 9 o'clock position. So <clears throat> if you think about um, potential uh, injuries or insults to the penis, they, they do have a potential area of buckling effect at that weakest point at the three and nine. 
Um, the albuginia itself is predominantly type 1 collagen, and it's interlaced with elastin. And <clears throat> interestingly, the circular inner layer uh, has the septum, and the septum is crucial for structural integrity during erections. In fact, there's a computer modeling image uh, that suggests that without a septum, regular flow through the corpora is enough to uh, rupture the uh, corpora without a septum. So uh, the flows through the corpora, so the flows through the corpora are enough to uh, to disrupt the sep to disrupt the whole corpora itself without that structurally integrous septum. <clears throat> now the etiology of Peyronie's disease is really unknown. We have uh, some ideas of what's going on, and most of the leading theories are associated with either a traumatic single event um, or a repetitive microtrauma event. And what happens is these tend to or are thought of as triggering um, a cascade of events that through an abnormal inflammatory reaction will lead to excessive collagen uh, deposition. So <clears throat> initial event happens, people may not actually uh, realize that it's happened, so a lot of people can't identify the initial insulting event. And then you get uh, tunical separation and effectively a clot formation, fibrin deposition within the uh, inner and outer longitudinal uh, tunica layers. So these, um, through inflammatory cascade and uh, react, uh, reaction, will increase things like reactive oxygen species, um, activation of NF-kappa-beta, and uh, increases in things like TGF-beta-1 and TNF-alpha, which activate um, effectively uh, increased collagen deposition in a disorganized structure that's abnormal. So on the bottom right, you can see on the left-hand side, the cleaner picture of the, uh, of the left is normal collagen, and it has normal polarity, and uh, it's nicely organized. But in the, in the Peroni's plaque, uh, there's disorganized collagen and... Uh, interlaced with elastin fibers. Now you can have rare events where the plaques will actually calcify, um, but that happens through uh, osteogenic ossification and we don't know the uh, necessarily the uh, inciting events that happen that cause that plaque to fully calcify. Now, the consequences of a Peroni's plaque can be uh, quite striking. Um, we know that the normal tunica uh, architecture is lost and collagen fibers become disorganized. But <clears throat> the disorganization and the, the tethering of the plaque to where the particular insult has occurred will lead to how the penis, for, uh, how the penis forms on erection after um, the uh, well, with the plaque tethering. So, for example, in a, in a dorsal curvature, the plaque is tethered on the dorsal side and the curve goes up, and there's no plaque on the ventral side. Lateral, the same way, the plaque is uh, lateralized, and then ventral is on the undersurface. <coughs> with respect to the natural history of the disease, it's kind of it's characterized by um, symptoms with a, with a variable course. So, um, we can really take it to two different phases of the disease, uh, one of which being the active phase. And this ha happens uh, after the insult um, and is characterized by inflammatory pain and structurally, and structurally remodeling pain. And that's, uh, the patients will complain about painful erections with changing deformities. And this can occur over 6 to 12 months. Once the <clears throat> this uh, changing deformity kind of goes away, or stops changing rapidly, the deformity kind of stabilizes in the stable or chronic phase, and patients generally get a disappearance of these painful erections. Um, <clears throat> originally, it was thought that uh, a lot of these Peyronie's uh, disease patients can actually have spontaneous recur or uh, spontaneous resolution of the of the plaque itself, but. I think most of the longitudinal studies now have just shown that no more than about 12% of patients will have this spontaneous improvement of the deformity within the stable phase itself. When patients don't um, elect for treatment, uh, within the stable phase, about half of the patients will see actually a worsening 
of this curvature. Um, as I mentioned earlier, spontaneous uh, resolution of the curvature is a rare occurrence, but um, in 2007, almost 40% of urologists that were, uh, that were questioned with a, uh, a questionnaire believed that uh, Peroni's disease spontaneously resolved in over half of the cases. So I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding about um, its natural history. <clears throat> so the patient uh, presents to the clinic, usually with um, a combination of these four major things. So penile pain, uh, especially inflammatory pain during the acute phase of the reaction, and then they can get this torque pain um, on erection. Um, and then they'll have erectile disformities, which we've talked about uh, previous, dorsal, ventral, lateral. You can also have circumferential deformities and an hourglass configuration where uh, the plaque will actually be uh, narrowing the penis uh, along the shaft at some place. Um, they'll obviously have a palpable plaque and some kind of erectile dysfunction usually is associated with it, whether it's just distal flaccidity, uh, distal to the plaque, or uh, upon full inspection in the OR or intracavernosal injections to create an artificial erection in the clinic, they can have things like hourglass deform or um, hinge effects uh, where you can actually bend the penis at the plaque site. One of the big things uh, I found actually in, the re in my reading of uh, Peroni's disease was how much of an impact uh, it had on patient psychology. So the if you look at a lot of the Peroni's disease uh, organization websites, they'll have testimonials about how bad this disease is for a lot of people. And um, in 2008, Nelson did a study where they suggested that almost 50% of patients with a diagnosis of Peroni's disease suffers from moderate to severe depression requiring medical intervention. So it's a huge number. And if uh, you believe the incidence rates of 3 to 9%, then half of that are undergoing serious uh, psychological uh, problems with the disease. Um, most of the things that the patients discuss are uh, things like sexual anxiety, uh, fear of forming new relationships, embarrassment, feeling of shame, loss of control over their personal lives, which is interesting. Um, and this all kind of culminates in this vicious cycle of performance anxiety associated with some of the physiological effects um, of erectile dysfunction, which further enhances their erectile dysfunction and puts them kind of down that spiral of uh, a really like a really like dire situation. Um, <clears throat> I think a common underlying problem in all of men's health is like an ability to go and present to the primary care physician or to the specialist. And certainly it's true for uh, people with Peyronie's disease as well. And these psychological stresses can, may, can kind of hide them and uh, lead to underreporting and lack of desire for diagnosis and kind of removing themselves from, the, uh, from medical intervention. Uh, <clears throat> so the patient comes into the clinic and he has these problems. <clears throat> the most important thing uh, from a clinical and treatment modality perspective is to really evaluate um, the patient with a detailed history, including that onset precipitating factors, if they can remember, um, duration and changes to the plaque itself over the course of time since it's uh, arisen. Um, any kind of prior treatment and pain and, uh, of course, like uh, screening for family history of, uh, of Peyronie's disease or, or a collagen deposition disorder. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I found in my readings was a, uh, an important question to ask patients, which is uh, their intromission capacity. So one of the actual uh, questions that they suggest that everybody is asked is if, is, if your penis was straight with the same quality and rigidity that you have right now, do you think it would be adequate for penetrative sexual activity? And that's really trying to tease out whether or not there's an element of um, underlying erectile dysfunction. And if there's any treatment associated with that, have they kind of revealed a new Peyronie's disease from it? Um, <clears throat> there's validated questionnaires that uh, we should be giving all patients, including the Peyronie's disease questionnaire and uh, the IIEF questionnaire. 
Um, <clears throat> important aspect is uh, evaluation of deformity and plaque size, and then documentation of uh, stretch penile length um, to allow adequate assessment of uh, treatments going forward. This is interesting. It came up in the uh, AUA guidelines for 2015 when they revised this, and they said that um, intra-office uh, intracavenosal injections with or without, so not necessarily uh, mandatory, but Doppler ultrasound um, can be undertaken before invasive therapy. Um, I'm not sure of the uh, feasibility of doing intracavenosal injections in the office, but it's certainly something that you want to have a good idea of before you take anybody to the OR. Uh, in terms of imaging modality, CT and MRI really have no place, but um, evaluation is ult with ultrasound is important, and this is uh, crucial to understand whether or not there's any kind of associated venous leak um, and to assess the plaque characteristics. And plaque characteristics um, can include calcifications within the plaque itself. And there's a calcification grading system graded one to th through three, three being the most extensive, and that's, to, and that's indicative of calcifications over 1.5 centimeters. <coughs> or multiple plaques over one centimeter itself. And interestingly, the higher the grade of calcifications, the less, the less people were likely to choose uh, non-operative management if they were gonna go ahead with treatment that way. So <clears throat> we've decided that our patient has Peyronie's disease. He wants to undergo treatment. He's motivated to go through it. Um, but we also have to consider that it's mostly a symptom complex. So I think the, it's appropriate to uh, assess these people for a sexual function, whether or not they need um, reassurance, reassurance versus uh, um, uh, referrals to the appropriate counseling uh, uh, allied health professionals as well. Um, the interesting thing is, it, like, Peyronie's disease doesn't affect survival. And so it's not imperative that everybody be treated for it, but um, it's important that patients have a realistic expectation about what they can expect from treatment courses going forward and how the ladder of treatment courses uh, would progress should things that we initially try fail. Um, <clears throat> that being said, the AUA guidelines suggest that there's no minimum curvature for uh, initiating treatment. And it is based on uh, how, the treat how the patient wants to progress with treatment. <clears throat> I think we all know that uh, Peyronie's disease is a uh, notoriously difficult uh, thing to treat, especially given the fact that we haven't had really great therapies outside of the OR uh, in terms of topical or oral agents. Um, and this is really at a fr like a frustrating point for a lot of patients. Um, suffice it to say, I'm not going to focus too much on the topical and oral agents because really nothing works. But we'll talk more about injectables and uh, modeling, and then uh, discuss some of the new surgery options that potentially uh, can alleviate some of the um, difficulties associated with surgeries from the past. Um, <clears throat> very quickly. I wanted to bring this up just because uh, the AUA guidelines uh, discuss this as uh, a big negative now. So no oral medication has been shown to sufficiently uh, treat any Peyronie's disease. So things like vitamin E, tamoxifen, procarbazine, omega-3s, L-carnitine, all of these things um, have some kind of hypothetical role in reducing the extracellular matrix or um, fibrin deposition within the plaque itself. But the problem with all of these uh, agents is they haven't been borne out in the literature. Most of these agents are uh, simply observational studies. Uh, they can be associated with uh, uh, questionnaires that uh, people will go through and they uh, say, for example, a placebo effect of vitamin E, for example, might come up and be a positive result in an observational study. But it's usually 
most of these studies have never been borne out against uh, randomized control trials and uh, against uh, placebo. So the AUA has suggested that clinicians not offer any oral therapy um, of any of the things mentioned here uh, alone or in combination. And importantly, it, this, despite its absence of significant adverse effects, the medications that were once potentially offered to these patients just delay uh, initiation of therapies that could work in the future. So what does work? Um, <clears throat> so intralesional injection therapies for uh, Peyronie's disease consists of mainly three things. Um, interferon alpha 2b, verapamil, and a new one which is uh, collagenase from Clostridium histolyticum. Uh, intralesional interferon alpha 2b is one of the ones that uh, it still maintains kind of a uh, a role in terms of how people want to treat uh, Peyronie's disease with, with injectional uh, agents. The theory is based on the fact in PD plaques, interferon alpha 2b can actually decrease fibroblast proliferation and they can increase and extracellular collagen production as well as increasing uh, collagenase uh, native to the, uh, to the plaque itself. Um, the recommendations for its use come from one randomized control trial and one random design trial, as well as eight observational studies. In 2006, uh, Hellstrom and his group performed a randomized control trial that was multi-centered, and they took a group of patients with uh, Peyronie's disease symptoms of over 12 months, and they had to have a minimal curvature of at least 30 degrees and no calcified plaques. And what they did was inject 5 million units of interferon alpha 2b every two weeks for 12 weeks versus uh, placebo, which is an, just an injection of normal saline. Uh, the results of this study showed that uh, curvature, plaque size, pain, and erectile function um, decreased. Uh, sorry, erectile function increased, but uh, curvature, plaque size, and pain all decreased. And erectile function didn't have any changes over sham injections, but uh, they both similarly decreased. The cur average curvature reduction is not huge, though. It's only 13.5 degrees and, uh, reduction compared to placebo. But interestingly, if you administer interferon alpha-2b, Patients will often describe like flu-like symptoms, including like a sinusitis, and um, and have some minor penile swelling at the injection site itself. Uh, intralesional verapamil, which is currently used uh, in Canada predominantly as the injectable therapy for Peyronie's disease, is as we know it's an old uh, calcium channel blocker uh, used in the treatment of hypertension, but it also has been shown to affect fibroblast cell proliferation extracellular collagen, uh, extracellular uh, matrix protein synthesis and secretion, and collagen degradation. And the studies of, uh, associated with verapamil are kind of, um, they're quite variant and very heterogeneous. Um, if you evaluate them as a whole, they had mostly nine randomized design trials, two randomized control trials, and eight observational studies. And the findings from the two randomized control trials are a little bit at odds with each other, um, giving you a little leeway in which to uh, recommend or not recommend this, uh, this injection therapy. But in 1998, uh, Riemann conducted one of the a randomized control trial on uh, patients with uh, a mean curvature of about 38 degrees. And what they did was they gave them injections of 10 to 27 milligrams of rapamil weekly for six months. And they found um, significant decreases in plaque length, width, and volume, but not in degree of curvature. So it's actually like shrunk the plaque, but curvature didn't change. And then Shirazi in 2009, with a group of patients that had larger degrees of curvature, gave 10 milligrams twice for 12 weeks. And in both the placebo and verapamil groups, they did show both a decrease in curvature, um, plaque sizes, and pain improvements. So uh, it's a little bit at odds, and there are some 
uh, observational studies and some randomized design studies that suggest that verapamil may have a slight benefit over placebo, but um, in terms of large randomized control trials with a multitude of patients, it certainly isn't borne out as a go-to uh, therapy. Um, <clears throat> so what potentially is? <laughs> um, what if we could take actually, instead of trying to uh, initiate collagenase uh, activation within the plaque itself, just inject collagenase itself? So this is actually a, not a new concept. It's uh, collagenase from Clostridium has been isolated uh, since the 1950s. And um, it's actually two unique collagenases, AUX1 and 2. They chop collagenase up at different points along its chain. But CCH, which is uh, collagenase Clostridium histolyticum, is uh, specific for... Uh, the collagen found in the coronis plaque, so collagen type 1 and to a lesser degree type 3, um, but, specific, but importantly not in type 4, which is usually found in vascular and nervous structures. Um, <clears throat> within Canada itself, actually, and the States, uh, CCH has been used for Dupuytren's contractions, in which they inject uh, CCH in and then manually retract or manually... Uh, uh, straighten the contraction about 24 to 48 hours later. It's also being trialed for uh, herniated lumbar discs right now and the plaques associated with those uh, after long-term uh, uh, herniated discs. <clears throat> uh, as mentioned, it was uh, investigated since 1966 for Dupuytren's, but the proof of principle in Peroni's disease really comes from 1982 in which excised plaques um, that were subject to either uh, normal saline or uh, CCH showed an 88% decrease in weight compared to 9% decrease in weight um, of the control specimens. And <clears throat> this prompted uh, Gelbert's group uh, later in the 80s and uh, beginning seriously in 1993 to start a phase two uh, randomized control trial looking at safety and efficacy of collagenase. Um, in which they looked at uh, its effects on 49 patients with uh, 30 to 60 degree curvature uh, and injections of a variety of different uh, concentrations of collagenase and found actually to be uh, well tolerated with no serious adverse events and a very good safety margin. So they got uh, the dosing out of this study and certainly uh, had a look at the adverse events. But almost 20 years later, I'm not sure what happened during this gap of two decades, but um, a phase 2B clinical trial was uh, completed and published um, by the same group, uh, looking at 147 patients, all 93% of which completed in, uh, injections of CCH. Now, the adverse events were significantly higher in the CCH versus placebo group, but mostly they were just mild to moderate. Um, patients would have issues like uh, injection site bruising, penile edema, and pain. Um, but interestingly, out of this study, uh, it came out that 95% of these patients had antibodies to AUX1 and 2 at the completion of the study and that no significant immunological events were noted, but it does suggest that uh, it may only be a one-time usage uh, of collagenase going forward if people are developing uh, antibodies, as they may develop uh, inflammatory plaques from uh, repeated injections. Um, Results from this is the mean curvature or mean reduction in curvature in the CCH group was almost 30% versus just 11% for placebo. Um, <clears throat> the big news came a year later where uh, Gelbert's group again published on two large <coughs> multi centered randomized clinical uh, trials uh, IMPRESS 1 and IMPRESS 2. Uh, from the United States and Australia. They looked at uh, 551 patients who received CCH versus 281 patients who received placebo with a standard injection protocol for each. Um, and the, 
the characteristics, I, I just put this chart up just to, uh, just to delineate the characteristics of the patient population here a little bit better, but you can see that most of the patients are Caucasian, and I guess that's not coming out. Most of the patients are Caucasian that went through this study, um, and most of them were in the 30 to 60% curvature range. There are some patients uh, about... Uh, there are some patients about 20% in each group who are greater than 60% curvature, or greater than 60 degree curvature as well. <clears throat> what they were administered in terms of the treatment cycle for each arm was that the CCH group got two interlesional CCH injections uh, into the plaque after developing uh, a... Uh, artificial erection at the injections were given at maximal curvature. Dosing regimens is 0 0.58 milligrams uh, for CCH uh, or the placebo, which is normal saline in the other arm. The upfront injections were administered 24 to 72 hours apart, so the patients would have to come back. And then after the second injection, uh, they had in office modeling. So the modeling, uh, which was crucial to uh, this study, was performed at uh, in office first on the second injection by the physician in which they would take and they would model uh, against the plaque. So they would take the penis and model against the plaque to try and flatten out the plaque. And they would do this for 30 seconds, holding for 30 seconds, repeated three times. And then the patients would be shown how to do this and do this at home three times daily until their next cycle. And they underwent four treatment cycles at six-week intervals. Uh, the results of which are actually quite a bit better and more clear than uh, the other interlesional uh, RCTs that have been performed before. So in the CCH group plus modeling, there was a percentage change of approximately 34% improvement, and that translates to a mean change of about 17 degrees. Um, <clears throat> Whereas in the uh, placebo group itself, it's just an 18% change uh, with a mean change of uh, uh, less than, sorry, a mean difference of less than 8 degrees. Suggesting that modeling, regardless of what kind of interlesional injection you provide, modeling is an important component of the treatment itself. Importantly as well, in secondary outcomes, uh, both PDQ and um, IIEF uh, satisfaction scores all improved with CCH injections and modeling compared to uh, placebo. They also provide this as a, uh, a visual cue of uh, how much difference you can get with just that 36 week follow up for this one individual patient with a baseline deformity of 45 degrees um, coming down to uh, a mean change of 17 degree uh, difference. Um, adverse reactions, as mentioned earlier, were significant in the CCH group, but again, mostly mild to moderate. Patients were actually, uh, could describe after the injections what they heard as a popping or cracking sound. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many of them experienced this, but it wasn't necessarily associated with any uh, adverse long-term outcomes, and those are the patients actually responded. So. Um, there was still uh, a number of uh, adverse events in the placebo group associated with just interlesional injections and um, mostly uh, penile ecchymosis, edema, and pain were the uh, most important or the uh, most frequent adverse events seen. Corporal ruptures happened in three patients and uh, these were all repaired surgically. These patients all didn't follow the necessarily two week course of uh, abstinence. After uh, each individual, after the second uh, interlesional injection, and uh, had these corporal ruptures during intercourse. So, what is the current status of uh, of cl uh, collagenase in Canada? Well, it's currently only uh, indicated or only approved and indicated for Dupuytren's contraction in Canada. But after the Impress one and two studies came out in the states, they uh, the FDA uh, approved it for the treatment of uh, Peyronie's disease, and subsequently it's just been uh, approved in Europe as well. 
I think it's being worked through the Health Canada ranks right now. But the striking thing that I found was that the cost associated with treatment was almost astronomical. It's like $3,300 per injection uh, in the States and giving up to like $26,000 <coughs> for a full eight treatments. Um, I don't think that's necessarily strictly the cost of the $3,300. Right. For example, your in the States costs $4,800. Oh, really? Six hundred per, so that's probably including like doctors' fees and uh, clinic fees. They in a lot of the like when you look up these numbers on the internet, they have a lot of the uh, medical insurance companies will say like copay ninety five percent coverage, and you know I think they're pushing this as like a um, uh, as an option for treatment in the states. And I know that uh, whether or not. The numbers will be similar in Canada. I doubt it. They'll probably be a lot more reasonable, um, but we don't know until it potentially is approved here. So while we're waiting, um, we have to kind of fall back on our laurels. Uh, surgery is still the gold standard for uh, a correction of Peyronie's disease, and in order to accurately uh, choose the right patient population and follow them through through the OR phase, we have to um, have a couple of different things that we have to consider. Certainly the patients have to be in the stable course of the disease and usually a stable curvature for at least three to six months. The plaques must be like unchanging and non-progressing. And um, <clears throat> uh, the patient has to have a, a realistic uh, idea of what uh, potentially uh, could be the uh, uh, could be the adverse effects of surgery itself, such as penile shortening, and um, whether or not there's any underlying uh, erectile dysfunction non-responsive to oral medication or vacuum devices. Certainly, the backbone of the uh, surgical procedures is uh, is the Nesbitt procedure, which was first described in 1965 by Reed Nesbitt. And uh, this procedure is uh, uh, in one in which the penis is degloved, bucks is uh, dissected away to expose the albuginia, and an artificial erection is made, and then an, an ellipse of the albuginia on the contralateral side to the plaque is made, and then closed with permanent sutures, effectively straightening uh, the penis, not excising the plaque. Um, it's been a very durable operation and it's shown excellent results but approximately uh, so there's some evidence to suggest that anybody that undergoes a Nesbitt procedure will have penile shortening whether or not that's significant is usually based on how much shortening and how much albuginia is taken and 17 percent of patients that go through this procedure have significant shortening which they uh, think is over 1.5 centimeters the Incidence of worsening erectile dysfunction after this uh, procedure is about 12%, and some people do describe uh, penile sensory, cha sensory changes after this operation as well. But the robustness of it actually has led to a variety or a, a bunch of different variations on the Nesbitt procedure. Um, I'm not going to discuss those, but uh, we'll talk about one other of the similar procedure, which is. <clears throat> popularized by uh, Dr. Liu in San Francisco, in which what you can do, it's called a 16-dot plication procedure, and instead of, so an artificial erection is made, penis is degloved, and a series of uh, uh, two O sutures are passed through the contralateral side to the plaque and sequentially tightened, effectively straightening the penis. Um, as you can see in the, uh, the bottom right there. Now, this is a robust procedure too, and it doesn't involve any excision of the plaque. And about almost 93% of patients will have straight erections at a six-month follow-up. Um, but penile shortening is still an issue, not quite as much as the Nesbitt procedure, but um, still an issue for a lot of men. And this can occur anywhere from 0.5 to 1.5 centimeters. As an entire grouping, uh, the AUA looked at 
uh, tunica plication uh, surgeries in found to be 60 observational studies reporting on approximately 3,000 patients. Um, 42 out of those 54 study arms showed improvement rates of 90% or higher. And uh, penal shortening was uh, uh, seen to be anywhere from 0.5 centimeters to 3.2 centimeters. Satisfaction rates varied uh, from 41% to 100% satisfied, but it was interesting in 2013, the uh, HUDAC uh, et al. looked at whether or not uh, they interviewed patients after uh, tunica plication surgery and found that even though in 84% had no, there was no measurable change in uh, stretch penile length, 78% actually perceived a change. <laughs> so I'm not sure what to make of that, actually. Um, <clears throat> an interesting caveat for, um, for an operative standpoint is deciding who actually could benefit from a penile prosthesis. And this is a patient that usually has an underlying erectile dysfunction disorder that's non-responsive to PD-5 inhibitors, oral therapies, or uh, vacuum therapy, has bad Peyronie's disease, but um, has got to the point where they're willing to try surgery. In these patients, usually the best uh, course of action for them is to implant a penile prosthesis. This has been looked at in over 2,200 patients in 43 observational studies, and in uh, 26 percent uh, or 26 studies, uh, they reported uh, curvature rates of over 80 percent improvement with uh, the placement of a penile prosthesis, as well as um, straightening uh, of approximately 85 to 100 uh, percent in these patients. And this can be done in conjunction with a plaque excision. Uh, grafting or um, modeling intraoperatively. The adverse events actually of uh, post um, implantation of a penile prosthesis after uh, for Peyronie's disease correction is relatively low. Actually, infection rates are are pretty acceptable, less than three percent. Um, revision rates for mechanical failure are approximately five or less than five percent. Um, <clears throat> once the penile prosthesis is actually placed and inflated intraoperatively, it allows you to actually uh, really firmly examine how the curvature changes and you can uh, do any kind of adjunctive intraoperative modeling um, with the penile prosthesis deflated and subsequently reflated, uh, as shown here in the bottom pictures. Um, for the... Uh, and people describe this as uh, attempting to snap the actual plaque itself um, after the uh, to actually remodel and then to seeing what actually it looks like once the um, device is inflated once again. The final thing I wanted to touch on is this uh, kind of new experimental surgery that was just uh, um, published in 2015. And it's in this bag of uh, surgeries in which uh, they're associated with Peroni's correction plus lengthening. Um, haven't seen this <laughs> anywhere, but uh, certainly this is a, it's a complex technique in which um, the penis is degloved, the urethra and sponge is isolated, as well as the neurovascular bundle is isolated away from the corpora, and through a series of a step incision, uh, and a corporal distraction, you can actually uh, incise the corpora, uh, remove it along its uh, the other corpora, and incise that as well, and pull these apart, effectively lengthening and straightening the penis. Um, with this, with the corpora reattached in the midline, <coughs> placement of a artificial prosthesis through in which you're actually going to have exposure of the prostheses at the distracted areas, but this can all be sutured up and the penis is re-gloved. And generally, this has been found to avoid the problems of associated with decrease in length uh, with an Nesbitt procedure or um, uh, some of the grafting techniques.
So this is I, this is like the experimental side of uh, what's potentially uh, going to be offered. But this is a very very specialized operation, and I'm not sure of the failure rates yet. I can imagine they're not a hundred percent, and I wonder how many people are satisfied long term. So that's all to be borne out in the literature uh, as more and more people undergo this particular surgery. Uh, just to finish with uh, some quick conclusions, um, Peroni's disease, uh, effectively it's an underrepresented or underappreciated burden in the men's health community, I think. And uh, it does have a significant psychological impact, uh, impairment on the individual. Um, we're still waiting on uh, approval for interlesional injections of CCH, but uh, they do have good evidence to support their use in the States, and um, hopefully uh, it will be available to our patients uh, coming up in the next couple of years. Whether or not we have to send patients down to the States for if they want to undergo this treatment, I think is a decision that uh, we have to make with our patients, and knowing that the costs associated with um, these treatments uh, could be pretty extensive. Um, surgery remains the, the gold standard and continues to have uh, durable responses for those uh, patients under willing to undergo uh, these operations. But the more complex operations, um, including penile prosthesis implantation and these uh, MUST procedures, uh, really should be formed, re, uh, reserved for uh, just the most severe cases and uh, those uh, with uh, high volume experience in, in this, these kind of things. So with that, I'll... Uh, I'll finish and uh, open it up for questions.